Hi there, I'm Jake from Lazy Days in Aurora. We're gonna take a look at your new camper now and do a little bit of a walkthrough for you. Um, congratulations on your new camper. Um, this is a Fusion Chrome. There is a lot to this, it's a beautiful unit. Um, we're gonna start at the doorway. We're gonna start on the outside. We usually do our walks from the outside so that we can see what's going on with the slides in. Then once we get that done, we'll get the slides out and we'll go inside and we'll take a look at what's there. Here on the front door, It does have a shock on the door. Now you have a lot of access to this unit, so you probably won't need to remove this to open the door. It will give you access of an inch or two more to try to get things through the door. Of course, with the slide, and then you have the party deck on the side of this unit, you'll be able to get in and out of it very easily. Now, screen doors over the years have not changed. We do bring this up though, because the bottom portion of this is just a screen from here to here. So we see dogs that come through, pull the kids through. Just a word of caution, um, they do make some aftermarket pieces that can be put on here to keep that from happening if it's something you wanna do. Now you have two front doors and they are keyed separately. They are not keyed alike. However, the keys on this top and bottom are going to be keyed alike. I'm gonna show those to you as we go along. Now the key on this one here, quarter turn to the right locks the paddle on this. Paddle locks are semi-secure. Why we call these semi-secure is for a couple of reasons. One, it's not a deadbolt. Also, they're master keyed, so it's possible other people could have a key to that. How, so for your own security and safety, we encourage people to use the bottom lock, same key, but you're not able to lock or unlock that without having the specific key to it. So there's about a 500 keys in that series. Um, you're able to lock it, lock it from the inside also. And so you'll be more secure if you're putting it into storage or if you're gonna be in the coach yourself at night. Also, when we lock this, or shut this, excuse me, we bring the travel mode here. This also is a locking device, meaning if somebody's in, they would not be able to open this without breaking this or without climbing out a window or one of the other doors. One thing, this unit has a lot of ways out, so it makes it a lot simpler that way. Uh, staircase is pretty basic. We just roll these up. Now you're in the travel mode and it's ready to go. It does bring up a lot of maintenance thoughts when you show this because um, things that aren't lubricated obviously are gonna get sticky over time. So a can of lithium grease will go a long way as far as maintenance on this unit. And this is one of those areas that you can use that lithium grease to keep that moving and lubricated going forward. Okay, we're gonna move on. We're gonna do the awning as we come back around. Uh, we will take a look here at the party deck on this. Very nice. Um, you can put a padlock on here for the safety of this. It has it on both sides. We're gonna open it from here, pop this out, bring it around. We'll go to the other side, do the exact same thing. Now be careful, I don't have a hand on it, but it could come out. We're gonna put a hand up, we're gonna bring it down. These doors are not that heavy. It's not hard to use. About 1,500 pounds is what this thing is rated at. And so you can have Bring the this comes out the on or the railing excuse me um, so you can set it up however you want in your campsite to be able to use that you also have an awning that's going to come over the top of this um, you have hookups for tv here and a mounting place for that um, the cable jack up there is a cable out not a cable in meaning that that is coming from not to so you'll hook that to your tv also you have power the power is a gfci like you have in your home with push buttons there is no push buttons on that that is connected to the one that's inside um, full stereo system, so you have surround sound that comes outside too. All right, I'm going to close the gate at this point. Very simple to do, just push it back up. Do the reverse of what we just did. Now you do have a full leveling system on this, and why I bring that up at this point is because we're going by the, these are the system jacks in the center. You have Four, six jacks uh, front what is the stabilization and also for hooking and unhooking your hitch um, these are full stable and then the back hold the weight support on the back these are up in the up position as you see them uh, brand new tires all the way around this tire size and air pressure we will talk about on the other side the bearings have all been repacked but they do have quick lube axles on them and what that means is behind here you can lubricate your axles couple of squirts of grease a year is all you have to do. Be careful not to over grease because what happens in most cases when people have a problem is they put too much to it, it pops the seals on it, grease comes around and gets into the braking system on the back of the vehicle, or the back of the brake system. Okay. Our back door is pretty similar to the front door. Exact same with the keys. 
Same with the screen door and the same with the staircase getting in and out of the unit. Now, as far as what's going on inside, we'll get in there in a minute and we'll talk about that. What's nice about these type of vents when you're talking about a toy hauler um, is they will are reversible, meaning you can open it out or you can open it in. And so you have one on the other side too. So what you can do is open one where airflow will come in, one will go out. So if you're putting a hot unit in, meaning that you had driven it and not too long ago, you'll be able to push all the fumes out. That is super cool. Thank you. Okay. Now this is two things. You can use it as a gate or a ramp. Um, we'll bring this down and then you can be on the back of it. Also, it's a ramp to get our products if we're going to haul things in the back of this as a toy hauler. Um, we will get your temporary tag on here. You do have a backup camera and you have full lights. Notice the little pins coming out on each side of this. Those are the awnings on this for the gutters. Um, the modern thing on RVs is it used to be we'd have water run down over the top of it. It pulls the labels off for all the decals. By having the gutters, it won't do that now. You're going to have coming from both ends. Full gutters, both sides, front and back. Now this is the ladder. Pull this pin out of here. Open this to get you on the roof. You do have a full walk roof on this. We encourage you to be very careful if you get up there. However, we do encourage people to wash their roof once a year. And what that is about is we want to see what's going on up there because the number one run of all RVs is moisture coming in from your roof. So the first thing we would look at is brushings. Brushings is where you've driven under a tree and you have scraped across the top. Obviously, we're gonna know if we've done that, so keep a good eye on that. The other thing here in Colorado and a lot of places in the country, we get hail damage. So if you get hail damage, keep an eye on that. It will do pinholes inside or on top of the trailer. The third thing we're looking at is probably what we would do ourselves as far as keep the best eye on, and that is around all the edges, around the corners, around the piping, around the vents is a product called Dicor, D-Y-C-O-R. Dicor comes in a caulking tube, and Dicor is a self-leveling cement. So what happens over time, and when you get your unit, obviously this will be checked and you'll be 100%, you will get some separations. Now when I do this, we're talking about something this big, not this big. Probably two, three years down the road, you'll want to make keep a good eye on this. Obviously, every year we should check it. Um, if you get a separation or you get a bubble, then you'll slice that bubble. It'll make a separation. Clean it with a little mineral spirits. We'll put a little Dicor in it. Boom, you're good to go. Uh, a tube of Dicor is less than $20. Most places is about $15. So you figure for $15, you can fix a problem that could destroy your whole RV. If it's not something you want to do, have another RV dealership take a look at, depending where you're at. Um, they'll get up there and take a look when you winterize, unwinterize, or other maintenance that you might have done at that point. Um, I do encourage you to have them take pictures. If somebody's looking at your roof, have them take pictures if you're not gonna get up there so you can see what's going on. Okay, with the toy hauler, we have a way that we can fill our own gas tanks as we're out and using them. Um, this is the pump right here. We have two tanks. One is for the generator and one, the back one is for the generator. The front is our auxiliary tank, which is going to run. We can pump gas out. You can pump gas out of it into the generator too, if you'd like to do that. Fuel dispensary is right here. We can turn the pump on. And that will activate that. This tells you how much fuel is in the tank to use. Just like a gas pump that you would have at a gas station. Okay, let's talk about dirty water. And that means that we have used this unit and we are going to dump our tanks. So the first thing we're going to do when we're going to dump our tanks is we're gonna pull up somewhere at the dump station. It's gonna be pretty vertical or parallel right here with where you're going to dump it. This one has an extra closed valve right here, a gate valve or a blade valve is what these call these. So even if you open your other valves, you will have to open this. The first thing we do when we get to a dump station is we check valves. So what we do is we make sure these are all closed. This one, and then inside the compartment right here, you have your gray and black valves right here. Now why we check those is because ultimately through vibration of driving down the road, they might crack open just a little bit. If they open a little bit, there's going to be liquid inside that tube. Now, because you have a blade valve at the end, that actually makes it a lot easier that you're probably not going to get liquid when you take the cap off. But obviously be careful because if something's stuck in there, you could have liquid in your tube. Take the cap off, put your hose on, put it in the dump station. The first step, what we're going to do is pull the very bottom one here. This is the black valve, that is the toilet only. 
as that begins to drain, we are going to take a hose from the dump station, which most of them have, and we're going to put it on this very bottom hook up right here. This bottom hook here is your black tank flush. Now, the way the tank flush works is there's a perforated tube that goes down the center of it. It's going to spray in every different direction. Give it five, seven minutes. It'll clean your black tank pretty good. Now, a key point to this is make sure before we shut the black valve, we take the hose or at least turn the hose off to the black tank flush. Because what happens if we shut that valve, then we are filling the black tank full of water. That's something we don't want to do. Now, once we take the hose off, shut the black, we can pull the gray. That's everything else. That's our sinks and showers. Um, if you wanted to rinse the, the gray tank a little bit, you could go inside, you could open up a faucet, run a little water. Most people don't rinse their gray tank much because it has dish soap, shampoos, that sort of thing coming out of it. It's not going to give you the smells that a black tank would. Now, once we're done with that, we're going to close it. We'll put our cap on, put our hose up. One step left, we go inside to the toilet. We put our foot on the pedal flush. Um, we're going to hold it down for about 15 seconds because we do not want to have a completely dry tank. It takes water in that tank to activate the chemical we're going to put inside. At that point, hold the pedal all the way down, which opens it up. We're going to dump in one pod or we're going to put four ounces of chemical into the black tank. At that point, you're done and you should not have to add chemical or do anything else until you dump the tanks and start over. Now, a lot of places that we go and ready to dump our tanks, we might have a full hookup, meaning we have rented a spot that gives us full electricity, gives us water, and also gives us a hookup for our dumping of our tanks. If we are in that position, we can leave our hose hooked up, but we never want to leave the black tank open because the liquids come out, the solids stay in. Consider the dumping of the black tank a flush, and so make sure that we have at least a third in there. If we want to dump the tank, maybe we've used it for the weekend, it's not to a third yet, add some water by holding the toilet flush down or by opening, putting some water through the black tank flush. That should take care of dumping of tanks. Now let's talk about fresh water on this unit. There's two ways to put water into a RV. First way is going to be a city water connection, which is right here. This right here is where you'll take a hose and put it here. And then we're going to put it to normal flow. This valve right here puts us to normal flow. This will put it down to fill the tank. On normal flow, we're not storing water. It's just like your house where the city water's coming from a big tower, pushing it through and you're using it. However, once you put a hose here and you turn that hose on, you do not necessarily have water inside this unit because the air lines are full of, or the water lines are full of air, including your hot water heater will be full of air. At that point, you'll turn your faucets on, it'll spit at you a while, and then ultimately you get a steady stream of water. Now, one of the reasons we bring that up is because of our hot water tank right here, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But the number one failure of all units from customer side is that they burn up their hot water heater. How they do that is they turn on the hot water heater without there being any water in it. It only takes seven minutes to burn up a hot water heater when there's no water in it. So the only way you know there's water in this unit is that we have turned on a faucet on the hot water side and you have a steady stream of water coming out. At that point, you know you're safe to turn your hot water heater on and you're good to go. This unit has electric hot water and gas water. Like I said, seven minutes on the electric side to burn it up with no water in it. We'll come back to the hot water heater in a minute. So as far as fresh water, uh, the only other thing about using the city water connection, a lot of RV parks have enormous amount of water pressure. You might think of getting yourself a little pressure regulator. It's about this long. It keeps it down to 45 or 55 pounds of pressure. Now, the other part of this is to take water with us. We call this dry camping. We're gonna go somewhere, there are no water hookups, so we need to take water with us. There's two ways to put water in a dry camping. One is we have the water to the city water connection. We turn this valve down. Now we are filling where that goes down, we are filling the tank up. There's also another way to fill this. We have an opening for the gravity tank, which is right here. And you can dump water, or you can put a hose in this and, and do it straight from here if you chose to. Now, once it's full, it's, it's gonna start coming out here where the overflow is. You'll get a little spit from here. Also, when the tank's full, there's you can see your gauge inside, they'll tell you that you have a full tank of water. Now, when you have a full tank of water, there's no pressure behind it. Remember, the city connection is being pushed from the city. At this point, you'll have to turn the pump on. You'll hear the pump run. It's going to go brrrr, shuts itself off. Everything's pressurized. Every time you crack a faucet, run the shower, flush the toilet, you're going to hear that run. Give it a couple seconds. Once you've shut that faucet off, it will stop at that point. Everything's repressurized.
Okay. That should take care of the freshwater side of this unit. Now, as we're moving back here, this is the exhaust for the heat system. It will get up to 200 degrees. Um, if we're dealing with little children, usually the children about this tall, the ones reaching up are the ones that get burned. Be very careful with that going forward. Now we come back to the hot water heater. This is an anode rod in the bottom. This will be pulled out to drain it when it's time to winterize it. Um, we do have a couple of resets for electric here. We also have pressure relief here. And then down here is the switch for the electric side of the hot water heater. Now you can run gas and electric at the same time. And if you do, you will get seven, eight degrees warmer and it reheats about 30% faster. Um, when people tend to use that is if they're in a park somewhere, we've rented a spot, we have full electric, we have our electric hot water heater running. It's the end of the day, everybody needs a shower. We're gonna need a little more hot water. Kick them both on at the same time, about 30 minutes before you're ready to use it and you'll get that hot water that you need. Now let's talk about winterization on this. Um, at this point, this will be winterized when this unit pulls out of here. Now, for, as far as dealerships, we're no different than any other, and we use antifreeze. And when I say antifreeze, it is RV antifreeze that we use to push through the system. The reason we do that instead of blowing them out with air, which a lot of people do, is when you blow out with air, water separates. And then when you let the air off the system, it comes down. It's almost impossible to get all the water out. And at that point, the water left is going to flow to the low points, and that's where it would freeze. It can be blown out, a lot of people do it, but you have to do it multiple times. By using antifreeze, it makes it almost impossible for it to freeze. How we do that? First, dealing with the water heater. Instead of filling this full of antifreeze, what we're going to do is bypass it. Um, to do that is right here, there's a valve. Um, water heater bypass, um, and we are off, and we are gonna turn that on when we're ready to bypass that to there. Now, no water will come to this. We're gonna let the pressure off right here. We're going to take an inch and a sixteenth socket and we're going to pull the anode rod out of the bottom of this. This is going to drain. You're done. This is winterized. Now, the other part of this is to pump antifreeze through the entire system. How we're going to do it up here where it says freeze guard, it's the very top port here. You're going to take a hose. You can cut a piece of garden hose. It's about two feet long. Take a gallon of antifreeze, set it in here, put the hose in there. Then we're going to put winterize on right here. Put winterize on. And once we have done that, now what's gonna happen is when we turn the pump on inside, it's not gonna pump water from the tank, it's gonna pump water from this port. We'll turn the faucets on one at a time, hot and cold, until you get that antifreeze come through. You'll see it at its bank. Um, even once it's come through, let a little bit run so it goes down into the traps so water doesn't freeze there. Once you've done hot, do cold, do it every location. Don't forget to do your outside shower. It should take about three gallons of antifreeze to winterize this unit. Also, what we got going on in here, there's an outside shower right here. It's hot and cold. You'll kind of notice on most RVs, they have the outside shower close to where we dump tanks in case there's an accident or a problem. That way we can clean it up. And it's also really nice washing the dogs. You can even take an outside shower if you want to. Clean off the sand at the beach, that kind of thing going forward. Inside here, we are settled, set for satellite prep. And this is cable, and we have cable hookups here. This is like this cable hookup right here is for if you're going to a KOA camp, it is direct cable from them, you would have to have a piece of cable to hook that up. Now, if you hook up cable, um, it'll give you those free channels, but you also have an omnidirectional antenna on the roof of this. It will pick up about 50 miles out, um, depending on where you're at, um, line of sight and location, but they do work incredibly well. And it's a full digital picture, so you can have, if you have an HDTV, you will pick up an HD signal. Okay, inside here is your power cord. We have a power cord hooked up to it. It's a 50 amp service, but with this one is yours. This is just our service cord going forward here. Now I'm gonna close the water heater at this point, and let's talk a little bit about your power cord. 50 amp service. Um, this goes into a transfer switch. Now a transfer switch on this unit um, does what we call a 330. In three seconds, if we plug this into a 50 amp or if we've adapted it down to a 30, it's gonna recognize the power and it's gonna set everything set and you're ready to go on this unit. Now the 30 second side of this is for the generator. So when you turn on your generator, this has a generator in it, it's going to run, um, take 30 seconds, excuse me, once it starts for it to recognize the power. The reason it does that, it's a warm up period. And ultimately it probably takes longer than 30 seconds for that to warm up. So we always encourage people, even with a good generator, is give it a little bit, don't, fire up all the air conditioners, running microwaves and multiple things that are taking power 
once we fired up the generator. Give it a little bit and you'll be good to go. But that goes through the transfer switch. Okay, we're gonna move on. One more thing in here. This is your battery disconnect right here. So if you're gonna put this in storage, you're gonna wanna turn, this is the battery is on, this is the battery's off, pull the key out of it. Um, there's a lot of things going on in this unit as far as status lights. And so when you leave it in storage, we encourage you to turn that off so it's not pulling power away from the batteries. And I'm inside here is our hydraulics. And that is full. Now notice right here inside this door, this is the leveling system. And I'll explain real quick how the leveling system works, but you can come back to this and this will tell you how to use the leveling system on this unit. We'll take the silver key right here and we're gonna open this up. Okay, so when you turn this on, you instantly have control of the front jacks. We can pick it up, we can hit retract, we can bring it back down. Now, once we've disconnected from the truck, and this is a key point to this, is that that spot, when you have raised it enough to get it off the hitch and we've pulled it out, it's gonna remember that height. And when we hit auto level, it's gonna remember that spot where we had it. One important point to this is when you hit auto level, make sure your truck is pulled all the way out and your rails are not under this because depending on where you're at, it could dump the front jacks, meaning it could drop it down enough it could set it on the truck. Um, takes about 10 minutes, up to 10 minutes, excuse me, to auto level. Should be quicker even when you're on concrete. Um, it will level itself and you'll be good to go. At that point, you can go inside. We can bring the slides out, awnings out, whatever we choose to do, and you're ready to go. It's very simple. Now, when you come back and ready to rehook the truck up, then we're gonna go through the menus here. And there's a couple of options of how we can do this. So auto retract, we do not want to hit auto retract because if we hit auto retract, that's all the jacks and that will bring even the front one all the way down. It will not hurt it. You can actually bring it that far down. It won't do anything at that point. We have a manual mode on this. Okay. Now to bring this where you want to go, we're going to hit left and right from the auto level system. And when you hit left and right, what it will do is bring the back jacks up and it's going to bring the front jacks back to where it was when we hit auto level. That's how the leveling system on this unit works. Now, if for some reason, let's say you are camped and you wake up in the morning and you're not level anymore. Uh, perhaps it was the ground was soft and it sunk into the ground just a little bit. Now, if it's the front two jacks, it's gonna be a little bit of a different situation because they are the, the hold the weight on the front end of this. You would have to hook it to a truck to do much with it other than push them down. You could just put it manual mode, go a little bit deeper. If it's one of the back ones, you could put it manual mode, bring it up, put a block under it, and jack back down on top of it. If you were going to take it all up and then auto level it again, at that point, you might bring the slides in, make sure it's all good and level before you have those slides out, and then auto level, start the process over again. Okay, below all this gives you a lot of good information. The tires on this, like we said, they're brand new. 235 80 16s, 110 pounds of pressure, that is cold. So meaning if you drive down the road for 100 miles, you're gonna be probably up to 114 or 115 pounds of that. A lot of good information here. It tells you how much this weighs, your GVWR, and also has your VIN number on it. Stuff going forward for you. We do have a light switch around the corner here. This lights the, the cap lights on the front. Inside here is our propane tanks. Now, how this works is, and we have, we'll fill both tanks for you when you have left. This valve right here is pointing at that tank. Now it's pointing at this tank. If you open both tanks, no matter which side that is pointed to, and you burn all your propane, let's say you've cooked and heated and there's no propane left, both tanks will be empty and you will have never moved that switch because all it tells you is which one empties first. Now, a lot of people with RVs, do what they call a one-on-one, -on -one, and that is where you leave one shut, you open one so you know when you're half out. If you're going to do that, then just push it, that valve to, or excuse me, that switch, it's really a valve, but we call it a switch, to the side that is you're gonna open. So this side's gonna be open, we're gonna leave it to here. If we're gonna leave that one open and shut this, we'll flip it to the other side. Inside here is our generator. It is an Onan 5500. It will run everything on this unit. As far as maintenance on this generator, uh, originally, which we're past that, 30 hours, 
is what they do for the break-in period. They change the oil out. And then beyond that, it's every 100 hours that it gets maintenance. Now, when this leaves here, it will be fully maintenance. So you'll know from 100 hours from when it leaves here, it'll be ready time for another maintenance for it. Uh, two brand new batteries. Um, they are deep cycle. However, they are not maintenance free, so you do have to check the water levels in them at least once a year, depending on how much you use it. I usually check mine in the, in the spring and in the fall. Okay, and then more storage over here. Pass through all the way through. And up there on the right hand side is your inverter. An inverter takes 12 volt power and turns it into 110 power. When we get inside, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Okay, we've made it all the way around. We're going to stop for a moment and then we're going to put all the slides out and we'll talk about what's going on inside. Welcome back. We have gotten the slides out. We are inside the coach now. Um, we're going to walk you through what's going on inside here. Um, we're going to start right here at the panel. On the left side up here, we have light switches. This will turn the bulk of the light switches on. Um, you'll find light switches throughout the whole coach. You'll also find some lights that have what we call a pop on them. It means there's a push button in the middle of it. If there's not a switch, it will have a pop on it to do that. Um, below here, this is going to be for raising your fan and turning it on right up here. Um, on the board itself, these are our gauges going across here. Um, we are at this point in the winterized mode, so we're not going to have anything in these tanks. Um, we can look at the battery, which is going to be totally full. Everything else will just be in the empty mode. Also, here is black one and black two. Now, when we were outside, we didn't talk about the black two because the black two is actually the toilet that goes in the back of the coach in the garage area. There is no black tank flush to that. Um, and so if you wanted to flush that, and I wanted to bring that back up because I didn't go over that on the outside, um, you'll just have to run some water in the toilet itself. But the handle for that is on the side over there. You'll see it for gray two and black two. Um, and it is on here to go to black two, and then you can go to black one here. This here is for the water heater. This is for the gas part. Notice there was a switch outside when we went through it, and that is for the electric side of the hot water heater. Water pump, you can hear the pump running. That is for only when you're getting water out of the tank. You do not need the water pump when you're on a city water connection. Now, right here is our awning light for outside. This is where we start the generator. Um, we have a couple of speakers in different locations that are ran from here. This gets the garage speaker, and this is our outside speaker. They're different zones, and so you can turn them on and off individually as you want them to go. Lights here, we have a step light, which is right outside the front door, or excuse me, right here on this one. And then we have security lights, and they these go back and forth because it's a couple of different lights, and you have one on the back too. And you probably saw those lights on as we walked around from the other side. Now, we have two slides in this unit. We have the bedroom slide and then the main slide right here, which we've taken out. Couple thoughts for you on slides. All manufacturers, no matter who the make and model of the unit and the slide is, agree on a couple of facts. One is that when you try to slide a slide out or bring it in, try to do it in one motion, meaning we're gonna hold the button down until it's all the way out or all the way in. However, if you are going to stop it, you notice if you take the button off, it, it will stop wherever it's at. So there are some circumstances where you would wanna do that. For instance, you might be stopping in a parking lot somewhere to have lunch, you don't necessarily want that slide all the way out because you don't want to be a big target to be hit in that parking lot. But you want a little bit more room because when the slides are all the way in, um, it does give you limited access to what's going on in the kitchen. If you take the slide halfway out, that's fine, as long as nobody's sitting in the slide as it's moving. Once it's halfway out or in any portion of that, you can sit in it. There's nothing wrong with that. But remember, it does not seal unless you're all the way out or all the way back in. At that point, then you can use it until that, bring it in, bring it out, feel comfortable to use it how you want. The other point to that is make sure we keep the floors as clean as possible. If you get a little stone or pebble underneath it, it will tear up your floor and scratch it. So something to keep an eye on as you move it back and forth. Okay, that will take care of that. We also have two awnings here, a front and a back awning. We put them in and out. Feel free to use them how you want to use them and you can stop them halfway out. There's not a right and wrong to it. Remember, they're a big sale. They're going to catch a lot of wind. Um, where most people get in trouble is they leave them out and then they leave their coach. So they would go to town to pick up supply or they might walk on the other side of a lake. In just a matter of minutes, a storm can brew in and they, about 35 miles an hour gust is what will get you. So try to keep them up. 
the main thing to think about is if you're not comfortable being outside because of the weather, then they should not be out. So when in doubt, put the slide or the awnings back up. Okay, that covers everything that is on there. Um, right down here is our vacuum system. The bag goes in there. You can turn it on. There's a switch right there to turn the vacuum system on. You'll have little hoses for that too. Um, the hoses are usually long enough you can actually take them out and get in the compartments too. Now over here, getting into the kitchen right here, there's the bag of hoses right there for the vacuum system. Um, they have a top cap on this, and this is if you want to put a trash can underneath there. So you can just sweep your trash off into that. And then you have covers for your sinks. Now, just a word of caution on these. 99% of the time, they're never going to move as you drive down the road. But if you do get on a bumpy road, you might want to take these off. If this pops out of here, hits the floor, it will break. Um, there's really no replacing it. You could get something else. Where you could make a cutting board or buy a piece to put in there, but it's not going to match. Also, if it comes off and breaks on the floor, there's a good chance it's going to damage the floor too. So it'd be something else you would have to do with that. Okay, microwave convection oven here. You have vents here, light switches here. You also have your cooktop here. So we have the three top burners, lighter here. Now the oven's a little bit different. This is pretty much old school. We're gonna have to hold the pilot in like we would. We used to have to do, excuse me. Um, usually give it 10, 15 seconds, and then we're going to light it. And then once we've lit it, hold the button still in because you have to warm that thermal coupling up. Once you've done that for probably another 10 seconds, you can let go and put it on the temperature you want it to be on. Okay, a lot of cabinetry, and we won't get into every piece of cabinetry here, but there is a lot of storage inside this unit. Now, right here's your refrigerator, Samsung. This is a full home refrigerator freezer. Very nice shape here. Now, this runs off the inverter. We talked about the inverter outside. And so we're going to get into electric a little bit. So with your batteries on this coach, you would be able to run this refrigerator for a multiple of days, um, depending on what else you ran it on. There's only certain things that will run on that inverter, and the main one at this point is going to be your refrigerator. Now, as we turn around over to this side, this is where your electrical panel is. And let's get in and talk about electrical while we're talking about that. Um, on the bottom is the 50 amp breakers for all the shore power on this unit. They are labeled what they are. And across the top, all these fuses are for the 12 volt system in this unit. This unit is about 75% 12 volt, meaning that the majority of what's inside of here will be able to be ran when you're not plugged into your 50 amp cord or running the generator. There are certain things that will not work if you're not plugged into shore power running the generator. Those are the air conditioners, the microwave, and any electrical plug that is not connected to the inverter. Those would not be able to be operational unless you were plugged in or running the generator. Now behind this here is a converter. Now we talked about the inverter outside that takes 12 volt power and turns it into 110 usable power. The converter on this, what it does is, is basically a big battery charger. It also runs all the 12 volt system on this. So if we are plugged into a 50 amp or even if we've adapted it down to a 30 or even lower, that converter is going to come on and charge the batteries. Also, if you turn the generator on, it's going to charge those batteries. But how that works is if your batteries drop below 11.9 volts, it kicks on what we call bulk charge. It's going to send hard and fast a lot of power to those batteries. It only does it for four hours because it does not want to boil your batteries. After four hours, if you were 11.9 volts, you should be in the 90% range plus. And at that point, it will go back to a trickle or a float charge. There are three ways to charge the batteries, or actually four ways to charge the batteries on this unit. First off, we are plugged into the shore power. That would be the first, probably the best way to charge. Second way would be the generator. That's going to charge the same way. Thirdly, would be plugged into your truck. If your seven-way came on off your truck, which plugs in, the front is going to have a trickle charge to it, and it will charge your batteries. And then the fourth way, if you wanted to add some solar to it, that would be a way to charge the batteries. So a lot of ways to do it, a lot of ways to keep your batteries topped off. Um, now you will, when you hear that converter go into the bulk charge mode, there's a fan behind there and you'll hear that running. So if you hear a hum noise, it's nothing wrong. It's just the fan running behind this unit. Okay, TV, stereo system. Um, you do have a fireplace in this. One thought on your fireplace, they're about 5,000 BTU. They work incredibly well. We do have to be careful with it though if you're in super cold climate, meaning we're below freezing on this. 
if you get this so warm in here with the fireplace, it will not kick the thermostat off to run the heater. If the heater's not running, then the underbelly is not being heated through that section with the heater itself. This just heats the area right here. So we've had people in the past that have froze pipes and they've said, hey, it's beautiful, it's 70 or 80 degrees inside the coach. Well, it's because of this, not because they were running the underbelly heat. So just something and a word of caution as you're going forward. Okay, right here, this is carbon monoxide and propane detection. You could also say it's a battery check because it, there is no battery in it. It's connected to the batteries on the unit itself. Um, it'll chirp real slow if it's a battery issue. If it's carbon monoxide or propane, it will chirp very loud and let you know that that's what's going on. Um, also, if you're cleaning the coach, be careful whether you spray Lysol or something like that on it. It will make it go off. Now, you do have a smoke detector in here, too. It's in the hallway, and that takes a 9-volt battery just like the one you have in the house. Okay, this is the thermostat here. So we have temperature up and down here for temperature. We can go to cool or heat, speed of fan, and then we can put it on auto or just turn it on at all times. Pretty simplistic, but it does work incredibly well. Now we're going to step back in here. Okay. Now this is the second thermostat. This is the control for back here. The one that we showed you up there controls everything from there forward into the master bedroom or the, the coach room up top. This is your TV obviously here. We have more light switches in here. Um, you also have hookups if you chose to put a washer and dryer in this unit. Inside here is your second bath, well half bath. Now the receptacle on the wall in there is a GFCI that has the push buttons. That's the one that's going to control the ones that are on the outside of this unit. This folds down. We have full bed. This also makes into couch, chair, and bed on top of it. Now I talked earlier about these vents and I wanted to show you this because how these work is we will pull these. We can go forward or push it and go back. So it'll open this way or open that way. And then if we turn around, we'll see the other one is on the top up here. Okay, emergency windows. Feel free to use your emergency windows in this unit. Um, in an emergency, we obviously would push this out, pull this off, pull the screen out, and then you can fight your way out. Hopefully you never need to use an emergency window, but it's nice to know how to use them. All the blinds in this unit um, just pull up and down. If you ever find these getting loose or sloppy and they start to slide on you, all we have to do is loosen the screw, tighten the string up on it, and then we're good to go. We'll be back to 100% on that. Okay, let's move forward. Okay, master bedroom here, master bath. Um, you do have a porcelain toilet on this. These toilets are what we call a double push, meaning half push will put water into it. Obviously, we'll winterize at the moment. Full push will open it and vacate the toilet for you. Um, light switch here. We also have fan up top here. Now, you have a triple glass door. Um, for travel mode, we're going to push this all the way up, and then this is how this locks down. Try to keep that locked as much as possible as you travel because being a triple glass door, it could break on you. Okay, I'm going to roll back into the master stateroom. We have another emergency window here. This is the second slide right here that slides all the way out. It's for the wardrobe. Um, a lot of storage back here. We also have lighting underneath for the bed lights. Um, this is the return air for the air conditioner on the front end of this unit. These are the returns. These are called power vents. Now, the way the power vents work on these is they should technically be closed all the time. If they're closed, it's going to push it through the venting system. If you want to come in here, say it's incredibly hot, it's July or something, and you want to take a nap, you can open these power vents and it'll dump 85% of the air conditioning right here on top of this bed. You also have TV here. And we do have all the remote controls and they'll all be in the drawer up front when we have this unit. Light switch for this unit is right here. And that really shows what's happening inside this coach. Congratulations again, guys. And I hope you enjoy your new unit. Welcome back. One thing we wanted to go over with you is the bed on the back of this coach. We did not have a chance to go through that. Um, right up here is a switch for this. It's a power. This is bringing the bed down. Now notice you do have a ladder on the top of this bed. 
that part of it is for outside on the deck so that you can get up and on the deck without having to come through the unit itself. Now the way you can do this is there's pins you can put in this when it's at the top and it will leave this at the top and you can bring this down if you don't want the bed and the couch at the same time. This ladder right here will get you into the bunk too. And you do have a table underneath that can go between these. I'm gonna pull this ladder off. And we're gonna set it on the floor here. These roll, and then this rolls back. Both sides are the exact same. You would leave them in the middle if you wanted to make that a full bed. So you can set that up with a the table there, and then that gives you full function and bed on top.